On today's Survival Dispatch podcast, we're talking about active killer preparedness. We are back with the Survival Dispatch. We're now calling it officially a podcast, at least I am, because that's really what Survival Dispatch news or this part of it has turned into. We've uh, put out a lot of surveys out there. You guys have been fantastic dropping some really great comments, questions, and topics for discussion. And one of them that really caught our attention is the topic for tonight, and that is basically active killer preparedness and strategies not only for individuals, but also for families. I think a very relevant topic to discuss, especially with everything that's happening in the world today. And I'm not going to do it by myself. I've got my buddy Salvador de Janeiro back with us tonight. I want to remind you guys that uh, Sal is not only my buddy, he is actually a self-defense and concealed carry subject matter expert and the author of The 21st Century Minuteman, A Guide to Personal Protection and Self-Reliance, in contemporary America available on Amazon. So welcome back, buddy. Thanks for having me back, Danny. My pleasure. Again, a very relevant topic, right? Uh, sure active killer preparedness. You know, we're never calling active killer versus active shooter because you don't have to have a gun in your hand uh, to create mayhem and hurt and kill people. And we've seen uh, crazy folks uh, use vehicles, sharp edged instruments, uh, other projectiles, other things, bricks, you name it, uh, to to uh, hurt people, to kill people and uh, ensue violence and mayhem out there. So it's a very relevant topic, again, that we are talking about tonight. You, ha you have presented some very interesting ideas and topics to me prior to this interview for discussion. And I think this is going to be a very interesting discussion. And I know right off the bat, I know you agree with me. This is 100% relevant to speak about, right? Oh, absolutely. Especially in light of everything that's going on at, at the moment. Yeah, for sure. I'm seeing organized violence. I'm seeing disorganized violence. And I'm seeing spur of the moment violence by folks that may not even have have preparedness or have a mission in mind or may not be a terrorist, so to speak, in our definite current modern definition of terrorist. But you know, we talk a lot about strategies, individual strategies for survival on survival dispatch, but we don't speak a lot to groups or fit the, the sort of the family units. And that really, in my mind, adds a totally different dy dynamic to that scenario. Am I right? Absolutely. It, it absolutely complicates your ability to deal with emergencies when you have family in tow, especially when you have small children. And you mentioned the book before. I actually spend a chapter in that book specifically talking about this. Uh, with children, when you're in public, especially when you're in crowded areas, the entire dynamic changes changes a lot. And if you're by yourself on your own, especially if you're able-bodied, if what you're doing, the vast majority of emergencies that would arise, you can pretty quickly escape the situation. But that changes a lot when you have children in tow, especially several children, especially if they're younger. Everybody who's a parent realizes how that just slows everything down. So we need to take that into consideration. And not only that, but in my mind, when I'm traveling in a group, especially with children, my mind is not always on the things that it should be because I'm l looking after the kids and making sure we still have them, <laughs> that they haven't wandered right. away or <laughs> being taken from uh, or getting ready to do, do something that might hurt themselves or someone else, or especially the younger the children, the more that attention is taken away from the environment. And that situational awareness is something that I practice every day, everywhere I go, I think I do anyway. And I'm one of those guys that I won't sit with my back to the door. I want to know where my exits are. I want to see who's coming and going, and I want to see what those potential threats are. So in my mind, the larger the group, the, the, the age of the children, there's so many factors to take into uh, consideration there that can actually distract you from the environment that you're in, right? Absolutely. Uh, especially young children are a tremendous distraction to your situational awareness, right? Think of when you simply take a child out of the vehicle or put them in the vehicle, right? How much time does it take you with your head buried in the seat, buckling them into a car seat, that kind of thing? But you want to be on a higher level of alert when you have small children with you. For example, when you're approaching the vehicle, 
you really want to make sure what's in that environment before you're busy and distracted for possibly several minutes, getting the child into the car or taking them out, et cetera. So it calls for a higher level of awareness. And um, it, ironically, it also may lead to a parent or guardian having to escalate to force sooner than if you were alone, right? We come back to that. You might be in, inc in an incident where if you were by yourself, you could very quickly extricate from the environment. Uh, if you have three young children with you or, or the like, you're not going to be able to quickly do anything, right? So you might actually need to go to force sooner if that's the case. And that's interesting. That was something that popped up in, in I think, what, our last discussion when we spoke uh, last week about uh, being injured or disabled and things like that. And the disparity of, I actually forget the term that we use, but the, the force continuum changes if you are not able to meet that force with the same amount of force because of that issue. In that case, disability or uh, injury. In this case, a small child. And that really comes into play, doesn't it? Correct. Absolutely. If, if you're disabled or elderly, your mobility is compromised. I would submit that if you have a small child, even one, let alone several, in tow, your mobility is compromised. And that's going to factor into the decisions that you make as far as what force you go to and how quickly you have to go to that force. Yeah, for sure. Isn't it funny how a lot of these topics, ideas come back full circle and we can apply them to a lot of different things. We had a great discussion prior to recording this podcast today, and you presented some very interesting ideas as it pertains to the family plan. And in my mind, it is absolutely ridiculous and maybe even unresponsible <laughs> to even go out in public without some kind of plan. And it's a shame we have to think that way, but I really think we have to think that way. Even if it's one other person, your significant other, when you add children to the mix, it really changes those dynamics uh, a great deal. So, and this is something we've talked about in the past. I'm just going to hit right off with that, that idea of if the crap hits the fan, we got to, and we're separated, we got to have some kind of meeting point, right? Absolutely. I, I think the, the first thing you should start with, especially when you're in very crowded location with a lot of people is have a plan for if there's separation. This would certainly apply to any children who are old enough to be capable of doing that. Uh, once they're old enough to be reasonable enough to point out to them, if you get lost, separated, lost, we're going to meet here. And what we come back to with that for the uh, for the link up plan is you really need to have two possible link up locations. So let's say you go to the county fair, right? That uh, example always comes to mind. Most parents end up at some point or another taking their kids to the county fair, something similar, large amusement parks where there's just so many people, right? Well, the, the most mundane thing that's likely to happen is a child gets lost. So they can very quickly just manage to you know, get separated. So have a link up point, something that's very visible in the environment. Say, hey, if you get lost, let's meet at the base of the Ferris wheel. Right. Because pretty much anywhere we are in the fairgrounds, everyone can see the Ferris wheel. And that works great for if people just get separated. However, if there's an emergency of any kind in the vicinity, right, whether that be an active shooter uh, or you know, other things that can happen, a fire breaks out, et cetera, you, you really need to discuss a meeting point that's outside of the vicinity of the event, right? And th this harkens back to things we've talked about, Denny, a few times, right? If yeah. if, if we need to link up um, in the event of an emergency, let's choose a place that's not in the park lot, which as we've seen happen many times, if there's some kind of terror attack, we don't want to funnel into the parking lot. Let's choose some place before we go into the event, say, hey, see the 7-Eleven over there. That's where we go if there's an emergency. If you have older children who are separated from you in the event because they're old enough to do their own thing, have that plan. If there's an emergency, no matter what it is, if it's something dangerous that happens in the fairground or wherever, we're going to meet up at that location. And yeah, that's an important yeah. discussion to have. That sure is. And, and like you said, that's something we've addressed before. Uh, you should always, 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 always have a plan going out in public, even if it's going to the grocery store for a, 
half hour to, to go to buy your groceries uh, with your kids or your significant other in tow. So on. So you, you presented some really interesting uh, outline ideas when we were discussing and preparing to talk about this on the podcast tonight. And one of those things was the strategies for maintaining eyes on your kid while you're out in public. And my question is, how in the world am I supposed to watch my kid, my my five-year-old, my six-year-old that's running around, wants to see everything, say, just talk to everybody and pet every dog out there, still maintain my situational awareness? I, I don't know if there's an easy answer to that. Do you? There's not an easy answer. <laughs> and that, that comes back to what we were talking about, how children present a true distraction, right? One of the ways we can kind of mitigate that vulnerability is to practice well looking at the environment when we're in those transitional spaces. And again, we've touched on this before where when you come into a public place, when you're leaving, when you're in a parking lot, right? These are the places where we're most vulnerable to actual criminal predation, right? Sure, so yeah. I, I'll give an example probably every parent can relate to. Uh, and this was a bigger thing uh, in the pre-COVID world. Sadly, it seems coming out of COVID, parents are less inclined to do this. But think of a shopping mall where they always have those play areas for the kids, right? And when right. kids are little, they love that. Again, it seems you know, post-COVID, it, there's just less uh, children participating in that kind of thing. But I remember years ago when my own children were small, you'd be in a place where there were hundreds of rugrats running around and it's very distracting. And you, you have to analyze what is the most important priority at that point. It's going to be not losing track of your children, right? Yeah. Because them getting lost or the worst possible scenario picked up by somebody that risk probably outweighs the risk of an active shooter erupting. Right. Yep. And I would further submit that if an attack happens, the top priority has to be knowing where those children are so that you can immediately get them out of there. Right. So the yeah. priority is going to be watching the children. So some strategies for that. One thing I discovered over the years is every time I was in these kind of places back when my kids were little is I would always try to position myself where where the entrance to the place was and be there, right? Because a lot of times those kind of facilities, it's kind of a funnel. The kids can only come in and leave in that one location, right? right. So if I'm there, I'm going to be able to intercept, even if I lose eyes on them, they're unlikely to, to get past me if I'm near that location. That also puts you in a place where you're going to be able to better intercept anybody of nefarious intent coming in and out, right? So a lot of times positioning yourself well, where you can keep an eye on the children and also be in a position where you can keep eyes on things as they transpire, even though you're probably quite distracted, you, you just do the best you can. And as a parent, that is simply the reality when we have little young children, when we're in crowded public places. I agree hundred percent. I know I've seen a ton of videos of child abductions uh, floating around uh, on, on the internet and it's just so disturbing and God just could, couldn't imagine ever being a, a, a victim or a, a parent of one of those young victims but it's 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 a shame that that is something we have to worry about these days but we do and then even or even if a child wanders off in a in a crowded public place uh you and i briefly spoke about technological advances and things that can be used to track children like air tags and uh, which is funny we my, i mentioned that to my father and he he kind of knew what the concept meant <laughs> but not really <laughs> had to kind of explain it to him but uh that's really a novel idea air tagging your children so you can track them have you done that i uh, i've not done it personally uh because really by the time they they became a thing my my kids are older uh, okay. if i had real little kids now i would do exactly that and uh, ironically I actually, a couple of years ago, I was on a podcast where we interviewed a couple of guests uh, talking about air tags being used nefariously. Oh, yeah. um, in fact, we interviewed a, a woman who uh, an air tag was slipped into her her purse at a restaurant, and she discovered it after she had left. And uh, she, she she's actually a firearms instructor, and she was switched <laughs> on, so she kind of pulled off to the side of the road when she realized it was there, and she was ready to rock and roll she was expecting somebody to roll 
up on her to try to abduct her. <laughs> Unfor- I, I, all I can say is, had they tried to do that, that would have been a happy ending. <laughs> had they tried that with that girl, uh, but uh, most women obviously would not be prepared like that. So they're used nefariously, but it's a technology that you can put to your own use. So air tag your kids if they're in a crowded place and put it somewhere that's unlikely to be quickly found if somebody yeah. were to grab them. Uh, another thing I would throw out as far as leveraging technology, we all have a cell phone now in our pocket, a smartphone. I got into the habit years ago of snapping a picture of my children right when I was entering a large event so that I have a photo of exactly what they look like at the moment and exactly what they're wearing. Because in the event that a child gets lost or God forbid, picked up by somebody, you have a picture you can circulate to law enforcement and the whatever security is at the facility right at that moment. I love that. I think that's a fantastic idea. And that surpasses the concept of, oh, I've got pictures of my kids in my phone, but you've got that. That's what they look like today. That's what their their clothing looks like, whether they've you know, had a haircut or changed their, their style or, or whatever. Since your last pictures have been taken, really, really good idea. And I would highly recommend that. Uh, just to, if, if there's no takeaway from today, other than that, I think that's a fantastic uh, takeaway as well. So let's go analog here and and even talk about some rudimentary things that you can do to uh, in the in the event that we're kind of on the topic of kids and we're going to go we're going to kind of revolve back around here because I think this is really important. We probably don't talk about this enough when it comes to this the, the this industry that we're in and survival and talking about these topics and kids are so important. Uh, even just having some uh, a, a kid's dog tag per se uh, or a, one a wristband with a parent's name and phone number, I think could be very helpful uh, in the event of a, an emergency or disaster or, or any traumatic event where your child may be separated from you. And that's something we just maybe don't think about because we've got all this technology there in our hands and in our pockets these days. And I think we should think about some of those old school techniques as well to do that. So we've established some ideas about safety and crowds and being aware of your environment, keeping an eye on your kids, where you're going to hang out so that you can keep an eye on your kids and other possible threats, uh, identification pictures on children, strategies for managing your kids in, in crowds. Really great discussion on that. But let's take it a step further and really talk about in the event of an emergency, what are the things we need to be prepared for in advance in those plans? And let's fill in those blanks. So again, with with a group of people with you, especially if you have younger children, it, it makes everything more complicated. So if you're by yourself in the event of emergency, whether it's a fire that breaks out, right? Or in particular, if we talk about the active shooter paradigm, et cetera, the single most important thing you, you can do is simply have some kind of game plan with your significant other. And it, it depends on the age of, of children that you're dealing with. Young children obviously are not going to factor into any kind of game plan beyond that yourself or the other adults with you are going to have to extricate them from the situation, right? But as children get older, you can discuss these things, just basic awareness for them in the environment. So pay attention to what's going on around you. Have that link up discussion like we've already had. That's a, that's a big part of it. Encouraging children to always know where the exits are pertaining to their environment. That That's a big one. And it's a discussion parents don't want to have because we don't want to frighten our children, of course, right? And you don't have to get graphic with the discussion. You can simply encourage if something were to happen, this is what we're going to do. If something were to happen while we're in this crowd, we're going to head for that nearest exit. Well, really that simple. And, and it's sad to have to have this kind of conversation, right? That we always have to even think about these things. But I, I tell people children are usually quite spry and fast, right? And yep. if if you can impart nothing else to them, teach them that they need to trust their gut gut when they know some when they know there's danger, they know something's wrong, run. 
run to the exit, run. It has been proven over and over and over again that the people who survive when they're at ground zero of these kind of situations are the people who take immediate action. Absolutely. I I, I have to tell you, in every corporate environment I've ever been in, when it comes to talking about active shooter environments, they talk about run, hide, fight. Run is run is number one. And uh, besides that, it's hard to hit a moving target. I mean, let's just face it. And a- active killers, active shooters, they, they, they want those easy, soft targets. Uh, if there's somebody sitting there and somebody running, they're going to go for the stationary target. Uh, in my mind, I, I think that's what's going to happen. So 100% I agree with that. Run, run, run. Uh, to teach our kids in that environment, of course. I suppose there are exceptions to that if they're older, if they have skills and things, and we probably need to talk about that too. And, and yeah. who does who does what? Are we going to assign them duties in, in the face of violence? Maybe we are. I don't know. What do you think? And that, that's a great point. So the assignment of duties, if you have an older child, you can have that discussion. And all of these things can be discussed in not a scary way, but we discuss these things before anything happens, of course. If you have an older child, you could have the discussion that, hey, if we're somewhere, your job is going to be taking your younger siblings by the hand and just getting out of the environment quickly, right? Another thing to talk about with exits, uh, in, in impress on your children the fact that exits that are marked as uh, fire exits or you, you, places you would not enter on an ordinary basis, right? You absolutely go through those when it's an emergency, right? Oh, fire exits, that kind of thing. Uh, teach them how in restaurants, the kitchens always have an exit, those sort of things, so that they know where they can where they can make an exit. And um, your significant other, depending on how they're wired themselves in terms of overall preparedness, I find that most couples where one one or the other is into this lifestyle and thinks about these things, the other usually does not. So if that's the case, at least have the plan that, hey, if things happen, your priority is you take the children, and you get out that nearest exit. Yeah. Regardless of what I do, we might all be heading out that nearest exit. Or depending on the circumstance, you who are, who is the family defender may have to do other things, obviously, right? So it, yeah. it's just a matter of talking those things through. And you can introduce these concepts to children as they get older. One mm-hmm. thing I would tell everybody now, if you have a child in, in uh, public school, and not just public school, any school, they have active shooter, you know, just like they've always had fire drills just like uh when we were kids and a little bit before my time out certainly my parents generation had drills where they'd go under their desks uh, for a nuclear uh, attack hey i I remember i remember that getting down in the in the under our desks or in the hallways and and covering your head facing the lockers and yeah i remember that oh so certainly so uh they're going to be aware that this is unfortunately part of their world so you're not introducing Introducing them to anything particularly new. I find that children are inspired with with more confidence actually when they have when they have a game plan and and bringing the conversation back to you know, this this kind of worst case scenario we can talk to the the active shooter or terror threat. If you encourage children run for an exit and explain to them how statistically, right, those monsters are looking to stack up bodies. Yeah. They're not going to take the time to shoot at the one kid who separates from the herd yep. to make it to an exit, right? They're interested in the herd. So yep. it's a hard conversation to have, but those are the best things you can do to to prepare at least younger children for for this this sad reality that's in the in our world. I would agree. And don't wait till the last minute, right? Prepare at home, have those discussions versus, uh, oh, by the way, we're on the way to a venue. If something happens, yada, yada, yada. If we can incorporate that into our education at home, maybe, I don't I don't know, maybe you have weekly uh, <laughs> meetings, weekly educational sessions with your kids and family members, or at least on a regular basis, uh, which I think is a is a great idea and talk talk about those those things extremely important and the each person's duties and as you said the duties and tasks will change be different for 
uh, older kids versus younger kids. Yeah, have those discussions at home in advance, right? Not at the last minute. And uh, train the brain, as I like to say, in advance so that you don't have to think about those those things certainly, at the last minute. Certainly having some semblance of a plan. And to your point about designating tasks, right? As a child gets older, that's where those tasks can, the child will go from being a real liability, somebody you literally have to, you know, carry and run out of the environment with a young child. As you have children that grow, they can become an asset. So for example, one of the first things you can start with with children once they're eight, 10 years old, start teaching them medical. So teach them how to apply a tourniquet, pack a wound, apply a, a pressure dressing. Uh, kids always think learning any kind of new skill is fun, right? So again, oh, yeah. it doesn't it doesn't have to be terrifying for them. Lay down on the ground, let them apply it to you and show them how to do those things properly. And it's, you you tourniquet the limbs, go high and tight with the tourniquet. Hey, if somebody, if, if uh, a family member is bleeding from a limb, you put it high and tight and you ratchet it down. If something happens in the junction, you pack the junction. If something happens on the box, you seal the box, right? You, I'm sure yeah. you've heard that, Denny, right? Turn yep, kit yep. the limbs, uh, pack the junction, seal the box. And it's not it's not that difficult. Once your kids are old enough, certainly bring them to a stop the bleed course. So they're yep. offered in every town all over the country. And uh, once they're certainly once they're teenagers, it's probably worth getting them into a one or two day full T triple C class or T E C C yep. class, that kind of thing. So now you're equipping them with life skills that they very quickly become a real asset. And you can certainly encourage them to be carrying that gear on them as well. Even if they're far too young to be carrying weaponry, they can certainly be carrying medical gear and know how to use it. Yeah, for sure. And if they're not know where dad keeps his tourniquet on his inside pocket of his jacket or wherever mm -hmm. this or that what a great idea take those kids to get them trained in and the information that can be valuable for a lifetime i don't know about you but fun things that i've learned as a kid have stuck with me through the years sometimes they're statistics or facts or uh just little obscure pieces of information that i just thought was interesting as a child and i held on to and yes. i still quote things that i've learned uh, back when I was a kid that I just thought was really cool or a skill that I thought was just really, really important. And just like when I first learned how to dress game when when I was hunting as a child, I, I remember a, a lot of that stuff and the steps and the procedures and things. So really, really great idea. Take your kids and get them trained. Teach them. Mm -hmm. If you can't teach them, take them to a class. Stop the bleed classes are fantastic. I don't know if they have age restrictions uh, or, or not. Uh, I, I hope I hope not because what a valuable life-saving skill that could be used even, even by a child. Yes, absolutely. In fact, I took last year a two-day uh, emergency meta medicine class. Uh, and in fact, that instructor uh, allowed if you had children 13 or younger, they could attend free. You oh, know, that's it was, awesome. Yeah, it was a two-day class that cost you four or 500 bucks or whatever it was. But if you had children under a certain age, they could attend you know, for no charge. So uh, there's a lot of really supportive uh, groups out there who teach great stuff. And again, even even your typical two to three hours stop the bleed class, which the fire stations in most cities offer that, that will show you the most essential stuff. And you get a kid at the right age, they could be 10, 12 years old. When children realize that they're learning something valuable, they always appreciate it. And you would set yeah. them up now to have a skill set that they very very well and uh, very likely in their lifetime may use uh, more likely on somebody else besides themselves. How often have people come upon a car wreck? I know numerous oh, people yeah. have come upon car wrecks and applied a turn in a kit to somebody or packed a wound on somebody, right? So it is a life skill that they will carry with them uh, for, for their life. And I think kids, uh, when kids learn stuff that adults generally learn, they generally hang on to that knowledge and like to share that knowledge with other kids. I want to kind of circle back to this and I'm, I'm kind of embarrassed to say, man, I, I probably need to be better about carrying survival gear with me. I, I have an, an IFAC, individual first aid kit, in my vehicle always. Uh, I've got probably multiple kits uh, around me wherever I'm staying as well. But when I leave my vehicle and I go to into a venue, 
we were talking about the mall, for instance. I'm not a big mall rat myself, but if I were to go mm. into a, a place and I don't necessarily stick a tourniquet in my pocket, I don't necessarily have first aid gear on me. Maybe that's something I need to think about. Maybe that's something we should all think about. I don't know. Uh, sometimes we're carrying a pack or a sling bag. Sometimes we're not. When we are, there should probably be less excuse not to have one on us, at least an IFAC kit with some basic survival tools, uh, not to mention weapons, which we'll, co we'll come to that in, in a few minutes or, or at some point, I'm sure, <laughs> during this discussion. Certainly. But that's something, I'm just coming to some self-realization about that. I've got all kinds of cool stuff in my vehicle. Right. I don't always have it on my person. And I think that's just worth talking about a little bit. And, and if you have any suggestions on how to overcome that and be better prepared, what are your thoughts on this? So I can tell you that for the past uh, quite a few years now, I carry on my purse. In fact, I actually carry a tourniquet and it's a small pack of hemostatic gauze. So that's actually in a pocket all the time. And for me, that, that goes on just like my gun goes on. If my pants are on, I have a gun on and a tourniquet. Now, the reason for that is not even so much related to violence. I, I grew up in a rural area where there was uh, a lot of farming in the community, and I saw many farming accidents. Oh. And you, you can apply this to woodworking accidents, construction accidents, farming accidents, or industrial accidents. Machinery typically hurts the limb. Yeah. And the way to stop major bleeding from the limbs is with a tourniquet. The other reason the tourniquet is the one item that I actually keep on body all the time is it's the hardest item to really improvise. You, you can pack a wound with a t-shirt. You can make a pressure dressing, uh, pressure bandage out of a t-shirt. An actual tourniquet is actually pretty hard to do if you don't have a real tourniquet. So personally, I carry a tourniquet on body all the time. I carry a full-blown IFAC with you know, tourniquets, uh, pressure dressings, chest seals, hemostatic gauze, etc. in the vehicle and in my pack. And one habit that I have gotten into, I can say, when I'm in crowded places with the family, I will add X stuff. So on a daily basis, I do have that tourniquet. It, it, it's literally smaller than a cell phone, uh, a soft T wide tourniquet. You can fold down. So it's so small. It, it's right. just be, I just dedicated a pocket space, made it my literally everyday carry. But if, if I'm somewhere in crowded environments, I will tend to put on an ankle IFAC. And there's yep. quite a few, there's quite a few manufacturers of those obviously you have to be wearing pants. Although with that said, if you're wearing cargo shorts, the cargo pockets are great for accommodating extra medical stuff, right? Sure. But if you're wearing pants, uh, if you find one of those cuffs that's, uh, I keep mine fairly basic. I have uh, a small pressure dressing, uh, chest seals, and the gauze in it, uh, maybe a second tourniquet or not, but I have that main tourniquet always on body anyway. So yep. I'll, I'll, I'll add that. Okay. And what I tend to do, and this is, this is relatively recent for myself. I didn't always do this, but just in, in the wake of recent events uh, coming out of 2020, honestly, where, where we saw just a lot of things get crazy is if I'm with the family in a crowded event, I'll tend to add the extra medical gear. And on the other ankle, I will add a backup gun. Ah. And, and the backup gun, a lot of people argue that statistically as a civilian, you never need it. You'll never use it. Well, here's the reason I add the backup gun. That's to arm somebody else. Yes. That is the primary reason I carry it. Because if you have older children, you might have a 16 year old who's a good shooter, but they can't legally carry a gun yep. right now. If you have a second gun on body and bad things happen, guess what? You've got now another armed ally with you wherever you are, right? If, if that child is indeed trained or again, if you have the very likely scenario that your spouse does not carry 
but they know how to at least have a basic understanding of firearms use, right? Now you can arm that significant other, even if they don't carry. For me, that is the primary reason to carry a backup gun. So when I travel or if I'm in really crowded in, uh, uh, environments, that tends to be the only time I will wear a second gun, but I just throw that out there for, for people's consideration. I uh, know. I think that's fantastic. And I knew you were going to say that. I, I'm, I'm getting to know the mind of Sal here a little bit. <laughs> Uh, because we, we are very, very much like-minded in, in a, a lot of our survival concepts. Uh, you mentioned the ankle IFAC. I saw, I, I actually, I used to work with somebody who carried an ankle IFAC. And it was, uh, uh, it was, a, it was a, a manufactured package that he had purchased uh, from some, some company in the survival industry. And I, 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 he showed it to me. I said, what a novel, neat idea. It, it was, it was it was hidden, mm-hmm. so most IFACs they're 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 a package. They're they're pretty they're good bulky. size, yeah, and they're bulky, and they've got molly, and sometimes you can run them through a belt and wear them on your on your person on your side or in the small of your back if you're at the range. Uh, I say a whole different story that there. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I always have an IFAC with me when I'm at the range, but why shouldn't I have one with me if I'm carrying? And I'm carrying all the time that should go hand in hand right yes in my mind and the truth is you're far more likely to use those those medical devices for things not related to violence that's that's the truth and i know very good point you come up on a car wreck yeah absolutely an accident an accident at a workplace or whatever or in a public place i i I admit, though, I'll be clear with everybody, I don't wear the ankle IFAC all the time. Again, it's something that in a crowded place out with the family, I'll put it on. Same with the backup gun. I pretty rarely wear a second gun because just out and about daily life, I feel perfectly comfortable carrying my primary carry gun. But again, if if we're in crowded places, and, and these are places where we can be armed and equipped like we typically are, why not add the extra insurance? And my way of thinking is the backup gun is most likely going to be used to arm somebody in your party, right? To arm the extra individual. And that may be a game changer. Think about Mm -hmm. if you're in a situation that turns into an active shooter scenario, maybe you don't, maybe you can't flee the area. Maybe you have to hunker down. And if you can put the kids in your significant other, okay, you stay in this closet or behind this pillar, man, I would feel a lot better about doing that. And while I hand my spouse that second gun, right? Yeah. And then yeah. I'll go look for the scumbag, right? Uh, but I sure wouldn't want to leave them unarmed there. So it can be a total game changer. So something I, I don't routinely wear either of those things, because honestly, I don't like stuff on my ankle. It, yeah. it, it doesn't drive me crazy, but I just don't like it. I know people, though, who 24-7, uh, wear an ankle IFAC or a second gun as well. I don't, yeah. but again, crowds, the kind of scenarios we're talking about where there could be mass violence in a place, I think adding that extra medical capability and a second gun could be an absolute game changer. I would agree. I want to talk about body armor. How feasible is it to outfit your entire family with body armor? And how, how feasible is it? How important is it? Is it possible? And if it's possible. So probably the most feasible way would be in backpacks, using soft panels for for backpacks, right? And it it is feasible. It's going to depend on do your family members routinely carry backpacks? Children now, not not little kids, but but teenagers carry backpacks in public all. So I would submit to put uh, a soft panel of armor in your kid's backpack. And again, you don't have to make kids scared or parents, but let Oh, hey, this thing is armored situation. You can take advantage of that. If you're fleeing danger, have it on your back, right? To give you ballistic protection. If you're facing danger, move it around to your front. You you could just have that discussion and show them how to do those things. Now, realistically, um, anything that could stop rifle rounds is going to be too heavy, probably, to to add to the pack and bulky. But I, I bring people back to... We have the exceptions of the active shooter attacks where they use rifles, but the vast, vast 
vast majority of of violence that involves firearms is handguns right yeah. so that panel absolutely uh, could add significant ballistic protection so if your kids are already carrying backpacks everywhere slip one of those in there in fact the last one i got uh to outfit a pack was uh from uh spartan armor and yep. it's so thin a third of an inch thick can stop up to 44 magnum and only weighs 1.2 pounds oh wow cool here's one uh, that i have uh this particular one's from Premier. i did some testing you can kind of see yeah. some of the uh impacts but it, it's really it's really quite thin uh, uh, here's some perspective yeah, probably very light right? it's thinner than the width of my finger super light and i think this one is 14 inches by maybe 10 and it, and it slips down. It fits really good in a backpack as well. When I asked you that question, I, I kind of knew the answer. I know I know my answers to that. Right. And my answers are, it's difficult to find complete body armor configurations for children. I think uh, probably the best solution is exactly what you're talking about. Uh, put a pack on them and put, slip a panel in there. Maybe for us as well. The, the technology has improved so much with body armor that it is it is possible to wear uh, body armor under a suit of clothes and even dress clothes these days and hardly be noticed. Yeah, because so, it's so the thin. technology is really really advanced to that point. But I love the concept of these panels of these backpack Absolutely. panels. I, th I think it's a fantastic survival solution for uh, for those type of, of situations and something that everybody should uh, should consider for sure. And these are things that we just don't think about sometimes. Mm -hmm. Guys like you and I maybe think about a little bit more because we're in the industry and we talk about it a lot. But the average Joe maybe not doesn't think about it. And for our viewers, these products are available to to anyone online, mm -hmm. am, Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, for, for if nothing else. And all you, all you have to do is Google it. You'll find it. And well, there are tons of, of uh, reviews out there. And, and Absolutely. And, yeah. And well, my, so my opinion on that kind of thing is what are the benefits versus negatives for it? And these panels are so light now. I, I have a, a panel. It's a it's a 10 by 12, like regular vest panel in my uh, EDC sling pack. And that sling bag is so light that I, I'll very often just carry that bag around because not only does it have like extra magazines and stuff that would be useful in a fight, but it has stuff that's useful uh, for any mundane, normal thing. You have a headache. I uh, got ibuprofen and Tylenol and all that in my EDC sling bag and a water bottle and all that kind of stuff. Well, that sling pack if I'm wearing it in public, which I often do, and it's so light, it's not really a bother. Uh, and speaking of which, that's, to me, more comfortable carrying that bag than putting the extra stuff on my ankle. So I have yeah. all the extra medical stuff in that pack, too. And if I've got the pack, I won't bother putting the stuff on my ankles. But uh, that pack, if you simply sling it around to your front, that's why I like a sling bag for this. Now you've got an armored panel in your front, and it only adds 1.2 pounds. Pounds. One and a quarter pounds, uh, technically, is what that plate w weighs. And that's all it adds. And it adds no thickness. Uh, mine is just like the one you were showing me. It's it's uh, that thin, and it can stop up to a 44 Magnum. It can defeat basically any handgun threat. And if it costs you that little in weight, and honestly, money, you can get these things for about 100 bucks now, these yeah. panels. Why would, why would you not? Cheap insurance, cheap insurance, get some body armor, get it for the whole family. A hundred percent, put it yeah. in the packs, put it in the bags. And it's not like the old school days. I was a police officer uh, as a young man and our, our Kevlar vests were like three quarters of an inch thick and it was mm -hmm. hot. My, I remember my first vest was a Safari Land vest. Uh, I was so happy to have it, but man, it was some kind of hot in the summertime and I was a Mountie, so I was on a horse, and, and I was in an outside environment all the time. <laughs> and the technology has really advanced. Oh, no question. To, to, to great lengths and bounds. So yeah, we're, since we're on the topic of equipment and things like that, what are some additional tools that we should consider to, to have 
uh, close to us or on us in, in crowded places. Body armor, IFAX, uh, weapons. Uh, mm-hmm. What else? What else comes to mind? I, certainly, if you're in a place that does not restrict your ability. Now, unfortunately, a lot of crowded places, they're going to disarm you, right? Like you go to a ball game. But even there, you can certainly take medical gear, usually. Uh, where Wherever you can be armed, though, I, I cannot stop encouraging people enough. If you can be armed, be armed. And if you're in a crowd with your family, consider even adding that second handgun. That would be yeah. the one time for a civilian that the backup gun really does make sense is if you're in big crowds and something, if something happens, you want to be able to arm somebody else in your party. I, I'll, I'll throw something else out that's kind of uh, interesting. When my own children were little, we would sometimes go to just different places that were in the evening and sometimes uh, in 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 the dark, be it at a park for some event. So the area I live, there's tons of like outdoor stuff that happens all summer long, outdoor movies at the park, all these kind of things. Well, I would give my kids when they were little, I would give them a little whistle with a little flashlight attached to it, like oh. with a with a key ring, right? So kids can, again, no matter how hard you try to keep an eye on them, they can disappear pretty quick. And I always told them, if you get frightened and you don't know where your parents are, you think you're lost, blow on that whistle as hard as you can. And they were those little camping whistles, rescue whistles. They are loud oh, yeah. as hell. And they're yeah, tiny yeah. little things like that, extremely loud. And they could turn on the light. And if you're in a big crowd in the dark and you lose your kid, well, if they start blowing that whistle and then turn on that light, you can find them really fast. So just something to consider, again, when children are small. Uh, As they get older, it's my opinion that the first tool that a child who gets older should start carrying is a flash. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. And the flashlight is absolutely these, and I'm talking about, a real modern good light, right? Something that's handheld, 500, 1,000 lumen, rugged, one of the good manufacturers, Streamlight, Surefire, that kind of thing. That is a tool that, that again, this goes back to the tourniquet and the gun, the light is the other tool that's always on my person. And these uh, lights, you get little bitty lights. Yeah, Here's a little and, stream And light. so powerful, right? And just yeah, this incredibly one's- bright. This one's rechargeable. You can see yep. the little port there. It's super small. I'm not going to blind mm-hmm. everybody, but it doesn't take up much room. And this one's this one's in my pocket all the time. Yep. And uh, it's, it's a great tool. You can even use it as an improvised weapon. Absolutely. And bad guys don't like to be identified. So if when you're out there in that dark area and you're shining your light, they might decide to make a victim out of somebody else exactly. instead of you. Bad so, guys associate bright lights with police. And mm-hmm. I have personally found that. I have a couple of times uh, flash guys who I just got the wrong feeling about and they very quickly <laughs> will move to the other side of the street or left. They associate that with police. Get your kid carrying a flashlight, a really bright one. I like ones that are big enough to serve as a good impact tool as well. And I'll teach them how to make a good hammer fist. And th- that's yep. quite devastating. If, if you sit, hit somebody in the chops with uh, the the bezel of a, of a solid flashlight, it is exponentially more devastating than doing it just with your hand. That's a great first weapon, but it's really not a dedicated weapon. It's a tool. That's a great first preparedness tool to get your kids going on is a good light. And it's a, it's a tool that I have carried all over the world on places mm-hmm. where I, where I don't carry a firearm or even a blade. Uh, the the light especially if you get one without the oh, the more aggressive bezels on them when i yep. travel internationally i use one without that so good bright very mm-hmm. robust if i have to hit somebody i got something i can really hit them with but again that bright light is an essential preparedness tool and survival tool. In fact, there's reports from uh, 9-11 how the people who got out of that building had lights on. Oh, really? Uh, because in the smoke of the building, people couldn't see. And, oh. and it was a consistent theme. People who survived like on the floors where yeah. it was black with smoke were the people who had lights on. Them. And that was back at a time they didn't have lights even 20 years ago, like we're talking about now, thousand lumen lights that you can hold in your hand. So it's an essential preparedness tool, and that's a good one to get children started with. Uh, it, that, it's interesting that we've gone this route in the discussion because I had made some notes here and I wanted to talk about, we watch what our, our viewers comment on and 
things that they want to see. And people were asking about improvised weapons because not everybody's carrying all the time, or maybe mm-hmm. you're somewhere you can't carry. Yeah, guys like you and me and most of our viewers are, we're pretty much Batman walking down the street and where we go. We've got a lot of stuff and we're prepared for just about anything, mm-hmm. but let's face it. There are places you just can't Absolutely. carry uh, blade blades in uh, firearms and so forth. So being aware of those tools and things that you can use around you, I do think are very important. We talked about in a previous discussion one time about fire extinguishers even uh, to use not only as an impact tool, but uh, to obscure vision and to, to be able to create that. That's uh, a very effective improvised tool, especially if we come back to talking about the active shooter threat. One technique that has been taught to people who just work in environments like schools and whatever where they can't be armed is you set an ambush at the choke point of the door. And when that door opens, you have somebody prostrate on the ground who's going to hit that guy as he comes through with an industrial, one of those big fire extinguishers. He's not going to see anything. And when you yeah. hit them with that, you have somebody waiting on the edges of the doors to to knock them out with whatever they've got. You've got chairs in the environment, a, a big 20 ounce or, or 30 ounce, uh, 32 ounce uh, thermos. I like the aluminum one. So they're metal. Hey, that yeah. thing full uh, when it's full of water, don't discount that as an impact weapon. Oh. And, and you teach children about these kind of impact weapons that they can use. But the fire extinguisher is a big one. If you find yourself in an event, There's active shooting. If you can't get out and you've barricaded somewhere, if you can get your hands on a fire extinguisher and you have people with you, uh, rally those people real quick. This is the ambush we're going to make. You have the one person ready with the extinguisher and people on the size of that door ready to strike with whatever's in the environment, stools, chairs, anything heavy. Uh, It makes it, honestly, if you have people committed, it's almost impossible for that guy to make it through the door. It, yeah. it really is. So he can't he can't defend both sides of that door as he comes through. And if he takes the fire extinguisher blast in his face, you got him dead to rights. But people are going to have to have the guts to do it. I agree 100 percent. And all this is we're talking about being prepared, but training, having ideas in your mind, your concepts of what you're going to do and practicing things. And this kind of all I'm a gun guy. You're a gun guy. I'm, all, I'm always thinking about have, have I trained enough? Have I trained my significant other enough or, or, or the people that are around me on a regular basis trained if not how can i help that training and what should we be training can you speak to that a little bit so so training specifically now if we're armed right yeah and, and we're- with so this is actually an emerging thing in the firearms training community where there's more and more focus on this so for a long time and there's some relevance to this argument it's such an obscure thing that dedicating specific specific training to it seems almost non-productive like why would you train for something that's so minute in possibility well the truth is we we just see it happen more and more and it's an anomaly that's quite different than other more common self-defense scenarios so i think it's well worth to dedicate training time to dealing with this there's a number of instructors who specialize in teaching these things uh some of the themes that have come out of this i'll I'll share a few uh first of all more focus on making shots accurately at distance with the handgun um if, if we look at that discussion you and i had a few weeks ago about specifically active shooters interdicting them with only a handgun uh yeah. of those 10 examples i shared three of them required shots over 40 yards right so we're right. at distances that are far beyond that typical stereotype of your average gunfight is three yards three seconds three shots all that kind of stuff right there we're talking about 40 plus yards for some of those examples no your point of impact with your ammunition in your carry gun, know where that thing is hitting at 25 and 50 yards. That's always where I suggest starting and yeah. do some practice. I'd like to be able to uh, shoot and put most of my rounds in the black of a B8 target at 25 yards and keep all of my rounds in a man sized silhouette at 50. And you, you, that can be done even if you're not a shooting enthusiast who's shooting all the time. If you specifically do dry work, uh, dry practice, and really practice uh, controlling that trigger press and practice your fundamentals and do some of that in live fire, you'll find you'll be able to do that. 
Okay. You might yeah. find that you want to change the gun you're carrying though, or to have something that, that you can do that. And I think this day and age, uh, it's worth considering that, Hey, I'm a guy who loves snubby revolvers. I carry one quite often. When I'm out walking the dog around the neighborhood, whatever, I carry a snub. I'm not strapping, yeah. but Hey, when I'm in crowded places with the family, the stunt, the snub might be what's on my ankle as that second gun we talked about. Cause that's a great second gun to arm somebody else with. Right. Yes. And they're easy, they're yes. easy to operate. Yes. Easy, easy, and easy and safe, easy and safe. Right. Uh, but you know what? when I'm out anymore in crowds, I want a gun that I know I can fight with and that I can reach out with. And, and that's what I carry. And again, my, I don't get crazy about it. I like, again, I like to be at 50 yards where I can consistently keep uh, everything on a man size silhouette and you know, even with pretty compact auto loaders i i can do that comfortably so mm -hmm. i'm comfortable with that the other big tactic that i've seen emerge from the guys again who are really doing a lot of research and teaching this stuff uh some of these guys have actually been in real incidents where they've uh interdicted active killers right a big one is learning the tactic of closing distance mm -hmm. using points of cover because what you are likely to have to do is you're going to and it seems counterintuitive but if you have a handgun and you're dealing with uh a killer or killers with long guns the closer you are the more benefit it is to you and that is the opposite of what we typically think right if you're yeah. a good shooter and you're dealing with the average criminal element who also just have handguns the the greater distance favors you. But if you're dealing with somebody with a rifle, you very well may need to close that distance. And uh, a tactic that gets taught quite often in these classes that focus on that is bounding from one point of cover to another, yep. which in public places is actually very common. Think of a mall. You have all those support pillars almost everywhere, right? Yep. Uh, and other hard points of cover. So bounding to cover points that get you closer and closer to that killer while you're shooting from those points of cover, that's a big tactic that I've seen is coming more and more into vogue. Now you bring up a really good point because it's not always the idea ideal situation we want to think we're going to be calm and cool and our hands aren't going to be shaking our hearts not going to be beating 150 beats per minute but it but it's going to be yes and you're going yeah. to be nervous and yeah. if you just think about the the simple concept of a target being you know, 50 yards away and you're shaking a little bit one one little shake here and you might have missed your target but if you've closed that distance and you're still nervous and you're moving around a little bit, you're, you're much more likely to hit your target and stop the threat. This is how, how simplified my brain works. I, I just think about those things. That's why I agree 100% uh, with that concept. So yes, train, train, train. Mm -hmm. Chris Heaven talks about this a lot. And Tony Blauer has addressed this muscle memory issue. And it's really, you know, we're, we're just training to react. We're not really training our muscles. We're really training our mind. We're really training mm -hmm. our brain. Mm -hmm. But that's not going to happen unless you dedicate the time to being out there. And, it, and in my opinion, it could be something so simple as to taking your everyday carry equipment through the range, drawing from concealed, shooting a number of, of uh, rounds at your target in a nice, cool, calm manner, checking your equipment, checking your actually making sure you're still good to go with your equipment. Things happen. Uh, things get knocked around. Equipment gets damaged. Make sure your equipment works. Go out and train. Use your equipment. Uh, I'm in uh, a competition shooter. That's my golf. That's what I do. I love to shoot USPSA, Steel Challenge, Run and Gun, a little IDPA sometimes, stuff like that, because I enjoy it. But gets, I get a lot of rounds on target by doing that. And I, I shoot uh, I, I shoot Glock format stuff most of the time. Even my PCC, my pistol caliber carbine works off of Glock magazines. So all of my personal self-defense uh, pistol caliber equipment runs off the same magazines, which is to me a, a huge advantage. I, I do, I shoot, I shoot significantly more than the average person, but I also do train with my, you know, I shoot Glock 34 in competition. I carry Glock 19 mm -hmm. on me every day. That's my everyday carry gun. That gun makes an appearance. Uh, every time I go shoot a match after the match, I make sure I get some rounds on target, check my equipment, make sure I, I use a red dot on my pistol. And that's something that I, I would recommend if you want to kind of take that next step into technology. Uh, it's okay to be old school. Iron sights are fantastic, but that's something that has allowed me as I've progressed in age a little bit, my eyesight 
to be able to pick up my targets and really take this whole concept of lining up my front sight with my rear sight, focusing on the front sight targets, a little bit blurry, sight is uh, clear, okay, squeeze the shot, to put the dot on the target, pull the trigger. It's really helped me a lot. And my competition shooting has really helped me become a better marksman uh, that way as well. But I guess what I'm getting at, I'm, I'm running off the mouth because I love to talk about shooting. I love to talk about guns is get out there and shoot and train. Yeah. Not everybody has a shot timer, mm -hmm. but you don't necessarily have to have a shot timer. Just have your buddy check his watch and, and are, are you ready? Stand by, go. Put your gun, put some rounds on target, see you how know, it goes. Denny, uh, if nothing else, I think perhaps the most valuable thing that comes out of training, even if it's fairly casual training, I go back to the fact that so many of those examples of active killers being stopped by people with little, if any, training. And I think one of the most valuable things, if not the single most valuable thing that comes out to comes from the training is simply having the self-confidence to know what you can do with the weapon. That's why I encourage people to shoot out longer distances and know exactly what you're able to do and and what distances you're able to hit at right that may factor into your tactics that you use to close distance how much distance you have to close right do you know what you can do with the gun but you will have the confidence to know that you can do it and that's what comes out of uh uh, of training if nothing else that is perhaps the most important thing uh you mentioned something that i thought was really important how you uh use all the the glock family of guns i encourage most people to lock into a family of guns like a particular model i'm a glock 1926 like that is 90 percent of my shooting is with those two guns and that's the guns i carry as an example for the past couple of years i spent a lot of time with uh an awesome walther uh, Q5 match pistol that I turned into my dot gun because I really wanted to I wanted to get as comfortable with the dot as with iron. I've not put dots yet on my carry gun, but I can tell you when we're talking about shooting at distance, man, there is no comparison. Oh, there oh, is fantastic. no comparison. I, I shoot 50 and 100 yard shots with a dot on a pistol, like yep. shooting a carbine. It is unbelievable. <laughs> yes. it's, a, it's a game changer. But I've not, I've not yet moved on to my carry guns. But anyway, I spent a lot of time with the dot. But uh, working with that very different gun, even though they're both striker fired guns, they're different. They have very different grips. Yep. So they have different muzzle flip and everything. And you spend a lot of time with that gun. The truth is going forward. If I spend a lot of time with a dot gun, I'm just going to equip a Glock 19 with a dot because I want to be in that same family of, yeah. of, of guns. And I think people do themselves a disservice. So I would encourage people when we're talking about an event in this modern world with violence that we may face, you want to have every advantage going for you. And if yeah. you mess around with, if you only shoot occasionally and you go to the range with 10 different guns that you're shooting, you're not doing yourself any favors. I know I love the toys too. And I know you do too. Yes. You get it, yes. Right? But lock in, this is life-saving equipment. It's not uh, a stamp collection or something. Yeah. Remember the old, the old phrase, beware the man that, Owns one mm -hmm. gun. Right. <laughs> there you have it. Right. Enough said. One sentence. Yep. Uh, and I agree 100%. Uh, we can go and we can we can train with all our toys or just have fun with all our toys. Yeah, nothing but, wrong with that. But really spend some time right. with your carry gun. Significant time with your carry gun. So, so important. Uh, I think... Uh, I think I'm, I'm having some ideas for a future episode. There was a comment on either one of our surveys, survival dispatch surveys on YouTube or one of our recurring comment uh, that I just want to address before we wrap things up. So much good information tonight. How to tell friend from foe. That is not always easy. And how would you speak to that, Sal? So if we're keeping that in the scope of our general discussion, where we're talking about, uh, family survival in big crowds really pertaining to to violence right uh, mass attacks active killers you're looking for an individual who is going to stand out in behavior and they're going to stand out and the reason i say that with confidence is in the aftermath of 
every single one of these episodes. The killer just bursts through the door shooting, which happens, right? We saw that in Maine uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, so that can happen. Now, if that's the case, there's no guesswork involved. Hey, is this guy friendly or is he bad? If he burst into the room that you're in and he's killing people, he's the bad guy, right? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty clear. So if we're talking, though, friend from foe, people who are going to commit violence in the environment, they will stand out by the behavior no matter how cool they try to stay they always do something that gives them away and we've seen that on surveillance over and over again surveillance footage that have caught these guys uh before they initiate the attack they're acting nervous uh they may be dressed unusually we touched on this before in an episode you want to be looking yep. for that on un unseasonably heavy clothing to be concealing things, bags that stand out of place, right? But it's the behavior. It's the behavior. Uh, if you want an easy solution like, oh, well, if it's a person of this ethnicity or with this kind of beard, well, you're fooling yourself, right? Because that is not, I can guarantee you that regardless of what the attack is, let's say it's just a, a, a domestic active shooter, or if it's indeed a terror committed by foreign actors, they're going to do their best to blend in. They're not going to yeah. walk around dressed in some kind of garb that you associate with terrorism based on what the media tells you that looks like or whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, they're going to blend in uh, very well. They'll probably be dressed and groomed to blend in, but it's going to be the body language. They are going to be nervous, and they are every single time. Every time we've seen it on surveillance footage, uh, the bombings that have happened in the, the Istanbul airport, uh, the attacks in Mumbai. OK, yeah. when it's on surveillance footage, how these guys are acting, they're uh, they're acting nervous. They're looking around They're They're what's called grooming. They're nervously grooming like this kind of stuff uh -huh. messing with their hair. There's yep, body yep. language that tells that they're nervous. Look for sweating. Right. Oh, is it a cold environment? It's unlikely the person just took a run. Are they profusely sweating? As far as if they are in the act, if you have to identify who's friend or foe when they have a gun in their hand, you can do it, actually. Uh, when we've seen active killers actually in the process of killing people, they have what I've heard referred to as like a bulldog stand. They are holding the weapon. And again, the long gun should be a dead giveaway. If you're in a mall, why is the guy got yeah. a long gun, right? So that yeah. should be a dead giveaway. You're not dealing with a friendly. You're not dealing with a fellow concealed carrier, right? However, let's say somebody's committing an act with a handgun. What are you looking for? Do you see a guy holding a handgun, hiding behind cover? and looking around trying to determine where the shooting's coming from, similar to what you might be doing, right? That's probably a friendly. Or do you see a guy who's in what's called that bulldog killer pose where he is holding the gun high and he's scanning low for victims? That's what we see consistently when these guys are caught on 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 camera uh, yep. i encourage everybody just look up if you can't find the video look up images of the columbine massacre okay. where those two killers look at the body language when they were walking through that school there mm. is this bulldog look guns are high okay they're not tactical guys who are mm -hmm. going through doors right holding their guns in an efficient way guns yeah. are high eyes are low looking for people hiding under tables, hiding behind furniture, et cetera. And if you see that, that's not a good guy. Uh, that's that's certainly would, would be a dead giveaway. Really, really, really great discussion tonight, Sal. I love discussing these specific things and, and you know, describing specific solutions, survival solutions, I like to call them. I love that term. And you know, when I watch videos like this, I want takeaways. There's so many mm -hmm. takeaways from today. I'll just uh, do a little rehash here safety and crowds we talked about that establishing meetup points with your kids your family strategy for maintaining visual on your kids in the crowds in a whole different dynamic dynamic when you got the rugrats with you man really a lot to think about pictures of your kids of what they're wearing today great idea air tags uh, technological advances things that you can use to your advantage uh, for tracking and, and identifying your children Having a plan in advance in the event of emergency evacuation plans, where to meet up, in the event of violence, who does what. Really great um, outline there. Really great points, uh, Sal, that you provided to me. Uh, teachable points. Uh, 
also that you can teach your kids and your family members, your significant other to identify exits, cover, uh, and teaching the kids to 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 run when the crap hits the fan, designating tasks to um, each individual of the group that's with you, whether they're family members or not. Oldest child leaves the younger ones out. Really great, very specific, good information. And then, of course, we talked about skills, medical skills for our family members and providing that training to our family members, taking them with us to the classes, teaching them ourselves if we're qualified to do so, fighting skills for the older kids who may not can legally have carry that weapon, but can take it over in the event of an emergency and just have to have it. And obviously tools to carry. Uh, are you carrying the appropriate equipment yourself? Are you staying trained? Are you equipped properly? Uh, additional tools to consider in crowded places when you can't carry your weapons. We spoke to that as well, and tools for non-permissive envi environments. And, and then we, you know, we thought outside the box a little bit. Just fantastic discussion. I always love our discussion, Sal. We really want to thank you guys. Uh, for our viewers, we'll have Sal's link in the description. We definitely want you to check out his book, The 21st Century Minuteman, A Guide to Personal Protection and Self-Reliance in Contemporary America. I love that title. It's available on Amazon. We'll provide a link to that as well. We want comments. We want suggestions. As you heard tonight, we, we address the, those those topics. Uh, if, if if somebody hits on a, a comment or suggestion enough, we're going to address it. We're going to talk about it because you guys are great. Uh, we don't always hit everything we're supposed to hit in our discussion. So leave us a comment. Tell us what you took away from this video today. What did we forget to cover? I don't know about you, Sal, but I'm not perfect. I forget <laughs> things. Yeah. Maybe there's something we do need to to uh, address uh, next time and, and cover additional considerations. So check out all our links. And by the way, we do have content that YouTube does not like and big tech likes to suppress. Uh, you'll notice we took a lot of our gun stuff down from the Survival Dispatch YouTube channel. We've put it elsewhere. If you'd like to view that content, uh, we'll provide a link in the description for today's video so that you guys can become survival in insiders, uh, survival dispatch insiders, and have access to that additional content. Boo for the folks who <laughs> making us take that content down from YouTube, but it's still available. Just hit that link. And of course, we want you to like, subscribe, comment, and share. I'm going to wrap it up. Thanks for watching. Stay safe out there. Thanks again, Sal. Y'all have a great day, and we'll see you next time.